Without further ado, I want to uh, uh, introduce uh, special guest, General John Heltzel, who uh, comes to us from uh, the Kentucky's uh, Emergency Management Agency. Uh, General, if you'd come forward, I'll let you, he's going to tell you more about who he is and what Kentucky Emergency Management's about. General, thank you. I prefer that one, thanks. <clears throat> Good afternoon. Oh, you guys are pretty good. Normally I have to do that twice. Let's try again though. Good afternoon. That's the military thing. I kind of like to make sure people are still kind of uh, awake. I am going to have a problem this afternoon though. That meal was outstanding. I mean, that was great. I would like you, though, to do, join with me in a round of applause one more time, though. I, I got a chance to come in a little bit early this morning and sit in in most of the classes. One of you all shut the door and wouldn't let anybody else in. I'm, I'm going to get back to that one. But the instructors and the material and the preparation in this facility, let's give the people that put this together a round of applause. Now, I'm going to apologize in advance because I can't stand still and do this, so uh, I don't think you'll have a problem hearing me. Normally, that's not an issue. I'm normally here to turn the volume down. But I do want to take a few minutes this afternoon to talk to you about disaster preparedness. And fortunately or unfortunately, it's something that I've, I've come to learn a little bit about in the last couple of years. My background is mostly military and information technology. I have 32 years in the Kentucky National Guard. I'm the deputy commander of the Joint Force Headquarters in Frankfurt. Uh, in the last two years, a little over two years now, I've been the director of emergency management for the state. And I got that job because I'd put together a number of pretty ambitious exercises, mostly centered in western Kentucky and on New Madrid. And I'm going to spend a little bit of time this afternoon talking about New Madrid, but I want to talk a little bit about everything that faces us, because you're talking about disaster preparedness. And I'd give you a test question, and I'd ask you, what's a disaster? And somebody would go, well, there's a technical definition, and it's this thing, and it's that thing. And I'll tell you what, it's not any of that. If it hits you, it's a disaster, period. If it knocks you off your feet, it's a disaster. So sometimes it's not the scale. It doesn't have to reach a magnitude where everybody knows about everything and, oh my goodness, it goes on for days and days and weeks and weeks and months and months. A disaster can be something that singles you out and takes you off your feet. So when you start talking about disaster preparedness, there are a lot of things that we need to lump into that category. Recent history, I'm not going to go back forever. Kentucky's got a long history of a lot of, of dealing with a lot of catastrophic events, but recent history. Uh, we started off my tenure with a, uh, something that really didn't hit Kentucky, and that was Gustav. But we ended up evacuating out over 2,000 people for Gustav. And then somebody asked this question. I was really glad today in one of the seminars because somebody said, can a hurricane hit Kentucky? And there's normally somebody goes, oh, no, they can. Yeah, a hurricane can hit Kentucky, Ike. Ike rolled up the Ohio Valley, and at that time it knocked power out for an astounding three and a half days. And oh, my goodness, that was just horrible. And it was horrible. We lost a lot of food. We had a lot of damage. One of my regional managers was calling me a while, and she said, I, a tree just ran into my car. And I said, a tree can't run into your car. She said, yeah, it can too. I think she's here today. You know, that windstorm came in and really taught us that we really weren't very well prepared for a large geographically distributed incident, disaster, impact, whatever words you want to stick on it. But that whole three and a half days, boy, we thought that was a long time. We thought, my goodness, three and a whole, whole three and a half days without power. And then about four months later, this little thing showed up called the 2009 ice storm. And my good friend Ricky's here uh, from uh, NWS, and, and we've become very close friends because he said, I knew that was coming, and I said, you didn't tell me, and he said, yeah, I did too. And, and so we now have a deal. Uh, emergency management and, and our friends at National Weather are like this on a daily basis. Uh, and Rick's got, a, got an agreement that if his stomach tells him it's going to be bad, he calls me first. 
And, and I, Rick, I want to thank you because you did call me and the last one we were able to be a little bit better prepared. Uh, but this preparedness thing is real. And I have a trouble in my job getting traction with some people to understand that it's real. So we had that dramatic, catastrophic, once in a forever, I hope, ice storm. And we all know that that's not realistic. We will have another ice storm that really position the Commonwealth to learn a tremendous amount about catastrophic preparations. And I will tell you today, the Division of Emergency Management and the vast majority of our county emergency management programs are not the same as they were prior to the ice storm. And that's a good thing. You all should feel good that I'm up here saying that. And I'm going to share with you some of the changes that have occurred. Because I'm proud of them on one hand, and then I'm still frustrated because it's really hard getting down to that last person that I'm trying to reach. I have a mission to make sure that we try not to lose anyone else. I take every one of the reported 36 deaths from the ice storm personally. Because I think that's what's supposed to happen if you're the director of emergency management. And I've gone back and I've worked with the state coroner and we've done an analysis and all but three of those deaths could have been prevented. All but three. So that number is pretty startling. You know, and it's a variety of things that cause that loss of life and I'm not going to bore you with all those today, but a lot, just take it that all but three could have been prevented. Three of them, I really don't believe there's anything that the system of emergency preparedness could have addressed. So we've got to fix that. We've got to fix that. And I believe we're doing the kind of things that we have to to fix that. And then about three months after that ice storm, we had some devastating weather situations in Kentucky. We had a tornado that moved across the middle of the state, then actually went to the eastern part of the state, left the state, came back as a massive microburst that hovered over southeastern Kentucky and devastated six counties. We had one loss of life for that tornado. Um, you know, it's tough to get ready for a tornado. Even with the warning systems we've got, it's tough. Uh, and up until recently, I thought that was really the only kind of weather system that was really hard to get ready for. I will tell you now that I personally believe that the weather systems have changed. I can't tell you why. I'm not going to go on record and say it's this or that or whatever. But I will tell you that the training systems that we have now of these microbursts are unique and something somewhat new to our state. And I'll, I'll tell you why here in just a second. Then in December, Pike County, far, far, far eastern Kentucky, been there many, many times in the last couple of years, got hit with a, a unique freak snowstorm that just sat over part of Pike County and brought down all their systems. And once again, we found out what it's like not to have power. And the winter is the worst time ever to not have power. But even worse than that is five days before Christmas not to have power. So we have developed a great, great, powerful working relationship with our utility providers. And we're blessed. We've got some of the best in the nation. And I will talk a little bit about the ice storm here in a second. But I will tell you that... The last house in Kentucky came back up with power four and a half weeks. I was in your all's class and somebody said, I was down for five days and I wanted to go, bah, but the last house came up. The last house at the end of the country lane on the hilltop, four and a half weeks after we lost the power. That's a long time. So three and a half days to four and a half weeks, think about the things that have to change in your life. A lot. A lot of things have to change when you don't have power. Later that year, a year ago, in August, we had another one of these training microbursts over the state of Louisville. I joke about that. <laughs> Louisville, from an urban standpoint, is a very large place, and it's got a lot of resources compared to the rest of the state. We're primarily a rural state. Lots of land, lots of people living away from each other. But when you have one of these training microbursts, one of the things you don't want to be is at the low end of an urban area, and that's what hit us. And literally, we got eight inches of water in about an hour and a half. 
and Louisville suffered catastrophic flooding that basically wiped out. It didn't bring the structures down, but nearly every building in that area, to include the University of Louisville, was flooded at a level never before seen. And then we actually got a little bit of a break and we went a couple of months without anything. And then this May, we had another interesting set of rainstorms. And it's interesting, I was sitting in one of the classes and I've been doing this lately as I travel around the state, and I go, how many counties declared a disaster or a state of emergency in Kentucky when Nashville flooded? Can you give me a number? What would you say? I'm sorry, you sat right down front. <laughs> Somebody want to throw a number up? Five. I got five. That's not right. Fifteen. Got fifteen. You tripled his number. That's not right. How many? Oh, still low. Eighty-four counties declared a state of emergency. And Nashville got all the publicity. And they should have. But 84 counties in the May floods declared a state of emergency. 84. An almost identical swatch of devastation as the ice storm. The only difference is it went about two counties to the right if you want to mentally picture the ice storm. 84 counties, 88 actually requested assistance from my office, and we responded. These things change the way you look at preparedness. They have to. They have to. And we've got to do things like this workshop to make sure that as many people as possible are thinking about what they need to do. And then in July, just about two weeks, after we began disaster release, e release efforts, um, we got hit with probably the most unique flood I have ever seen in Pike County. And I've actually got some video that I'm not gonna show today, but I'm gonna, I wanted you to listen to me for a second. I'd finally gotten a weekend off. Now as a National Guard officer, I normally drill a couple of weekends and, and God sees fit to make emergency management happen on about one or two weekends too. I had finally gotten a weekend off and I'd gone to Pioneer Playhouse with my wife. It's an outdoor theater, it's very nice. She was really happy that it was a Saturday night and I was home and we were doing something. And this little Blackberry that I can't get away from goes off. And I go, well, hang on, I need, to, I need to step out. And it's my duty officer in Frankfurt and he says, General, I just need you to know that something's, go something's going on in Pike County. Again, Pike County. Well, that's never good when they can't tell you what it is that's going on. And I've, I've changed things a little bit. I actually call the county emergency management director whenever something's going on that we don't seem to have situational awareness on. That's a military term. That also means knowing what's going on, okay? So I called up Doug and I said, Doug Tackett. Doug is a very, very great emergency manager. Uh, I said, Doug, what's happening? He said, General, I don't know yet. All I know is the last call I got said we have nine people on a roof and we got to figure out how to get them off. And I said, from what? He said, it's flooding here. It started raining 20 minutes ago. I can't see two feet in front of me and it doesn't appear to be letting up. It rained like that for the next hour and a half. More than 300 homes were swept off the hillsides. When I talk about being swept off the hillside, if you're not from, you all have beautiful flat land out here, it's great. Eastern Kentucky, not so much flat land, so the flat land you've got is kind of along the stream beds, right? These people not only lost their house, their mobile home or their house actually was swept away, but the land that they owned, that had been in their family for generations, was no longer in that county. You have the mountain and you have the stream now. You have no flat land at all. There's about 120 houses in that condition right now. And then two weeks after that, that same, we call it that, so our friends at FEMA, thank you, Laura, would help us with this, allowed us to add on similar flooding that happened in Carter County and Lewis County in the Northeast. So for what was going to be my retirement job in the last two years, I've worked through seven presidentially declared disasters and four undeclared disasters. Now, the governor asked me if I brought all that with me, and I tell him I'm pretty sure I didn't, but he said, well, I'm glad you're there. I'm glad I'm there, too, because what I found over the last two years is I get to work with the greatest people in this state. I've always known our National Guard was just without peer, period. But what I found is that our 
emergency responders, our first responders, our firefighters, our law enforcement, backed up by our emergency management personnel, and then unbelievably well supported by our volunteer agencies, and I'll talk about that at the end. Uh, really, we're blessed. We're blessed, because if we didn't have those teams, we wouldn't be able to do what we've been asked to do time and time and time again. And the one thing I will tell you all now, and I hope I remember to say it again, because I try to use it every time I talk, I guarantee you we will have another weather event in Kentucky. I just can't tell you when. But we will have one. So we've been very, very busy. And we've learned a lot of lessons. And I want to talk a little bit about the ice storm, because it's hard to come to western Kentucky and not talk about the ice storm. But I, I want everybody out here to understand something. Because there's a, some people in western Kentucky, and I can tell by looking around the room, it's not you all. But some people in western Kentucky think it only happened to us. 103 out of 120 counties. 103. Might as well just tossed in the other 17 and said it was everybody. I'm glad we didn't, but that's a lot. It's unusual to have an entire state go upside down. That's what I call a disaster, going upside down. And it was very, very, very bad in western Kentucky. And it was acerbated by some systems that weren't in place that we're working very hard to put in place. But here's what the ice storm was like for me. I had uh, decided that I needed to go to Washington, D.C. and had arranged a trip to try to get some more money from the federal government. And I knew the storm was coming in, but Ricky hadn't called me personally at that point. We didn't have a close working relationship yet. <laughs> so the last thing I heard before I got on the airplane was it may not develop throughout Kentucky. It may get Tennessee. So I went to Washington. And I'm there, and I'm, I'm on the BlackBerry, and I'm talking, and I'm trying to get money out of Washington because that's, that's the nature of my business. I have to try to steal money every place I can. I call it steal, stealing money. It's really our money. I just want more of it in Kentucky. And finally, the phone rings, and it's the governor's office. And I'd been on the phone with my staff, and I knew what we were getting in, and, and the governor said, General, what do you think? I said, Sir, I'm going to call you back in about an hour. And I think what I'm going to tell you at that point is that we need to request an emergency declaration. We'd never, ever in the history of Kentucky requested an emergency declaration before. An emergency declaration basically says, we may not be able to recover from this. We may not have the resources to handle this ourselves. It's very unusual. Um, and, and so it wasn't something that I wanted to make a light decision about. And uh, it literally, I called him back in 45 minutes because I'd managed to get some reports in from Lori King, who was Lori King then, who's here now. And she, she and I got on the phone for just a second, and she said, it's really, really bad, and we need to do whatever we can. And so I got back on the phone with the governor's office, and I said, sir, my recommendation is we do the following. And I basically walked him through it, and he said, okay, where are you? I said, well, I'm in a hotel room in Washington, D.C. right now. He said, where's General Tanini? Well, he's in a hotel room in Washington, D.C., but in a different hotel. And we, as a state, use AT&T as our phone carrier. And I love AT&T. They're a great company. But the problem was that ice storm decided to pick on AT&T and basically shut it down. So while I'm talking to the governor, the phone's going in and out, which really frustrates the governor. <laughs> if you want to know, that's one thing he's not, he's not keen on. Um, but, but I had good connectivity back to my office, so we started our battle plan at that point. And I called uh, Colonel Wayne Bird, who was the J3, that's a military term for operations. He's my operations guy. And we knew this was bad because we talked to the people out here. And I said, Wayne, I need you to uh, execute the new Madrid seismic zone plan. And he goes, got it. And he and I have been friends for a long time, so there wasn't a lot of dialogue going on. That was the plan that I wrote in 2007 and that we exercised in 2008 about how we would respond to the earthquake. And literally, we put 1,900 National Guardsmen into Western Kentucky in about a day, day and a half, which is pretty fast. It's not fast enough. We have new plans, but it's pretty fast to mobilize 1,900 National Guardsmen. I managed to fly back a day later, landed, uh, I was supposed to land in Lexington. Couldn't get into Lexington. I took off going to land in Lexington. Halfway there, they said, we're rerouting your flight to uh, Cincinnati, and good luck. <laughs> it 
it was good for me because I was able to get a message in to my regional manager in northern Kentucky, and I said, Rick, I need you to pick me up at the airport and then drive me to Lexington. He did. We drove to Lexington. We spent 45 minutes knocking the ice off my truck, my big blue truck that's out here. And then I drove, and I had, this is really bad. This is a personal part of this. We had power at my house the first day and a half of the ice storm, which my wife is there with our chihuahua, all right? <laughs> a lot of comfort. Uh, but the next day, we lost power, so my wife has no power. I'm in Washington. I had to drive by my house, kind of wave at her as I went, and go on into the EOC. And we came into the EOC, and we started again our statewide conference calls, which we continued for the next three weeks. Um, once we got in, the governor had just landed, and we agreed that uh, we would, we would mo activate the entire Kentucky National Guard. First time in the history we activated the entire Kentucky National Guard. Probably won't be the last time, but it was the first time. I'm blessed to have good bosses. General, uh, General Tanini is an excellent adjutant general. Uh, governor Bashir is an outstanding uh, governor. From a commander's standpoint, which is kind of what I feel like the director is, although I don't get to command that much, uh, he basically said, do whatever you have to to take care of these people. That's all I needed to hear. And we started doing things that had never been done before. One of those was to stand up a logistics resupply chain that had never been actively practiced in the state before. It had been conceived of and documented, but never done, because it's very expensive to do. In the course of 24 hours, we went from no one working in resource management to 17 people working around the clock to push supplies into Western Kentucky. We moved over two and a half million containers of water and over a million and a half meals. And we started working very, very closely with our friends at FEMA. Uh, one of my lifelong friends, Mr. Kim Kaddish, uh, ended up coming back to be uh, our FCO for that. And I will tell you, and I, I'll mention this, you cannot have too many friends or too many good relationships when you start talking about disaster preparedness and especially during disaster response. My good friend in Tennessee, General Bassham, uh, my counterpart down there, volunteered to move some people up into far western Kentucky because it literally took three days to get to western Kentucky. There was no fast way to get there. And then I had a good friend in Indiana go down and come in and backstop us in the EOC. We went into 24-hour operations. We didn't come out of 24-hour operations for three and a half weeks. And I don't care how good you are, you can't stand on your head for three and a half weeks. So we had, we had called on our friends, and they came in and helped us. From that point forward, though, it was a matter of continuing the dialogue to find out what the needs were in western Kentucky and what we could do to help you all in western Kentucky. And that dialogue is something that we've continued to build nonstop. In fact, our battle rhythm, or the way we respond now, is we conduct statewide conference calls twice a day to find out what's going on and to reassure your senior elected officials about we're here in case they need us and what is it that we're doing. But it's all about emergency preparedness because the truth is if we'd have been better prepared, maybe we'd have lessened the pain a little bit. I still think there have been people that would have died in that storm, but maybe we could have made it a little bit better. So this preparedness mission is something that I take extremely seriously, and hopefully from what I've, the stories I've just shared with you, you can understand why. So on your theme, let me talk a little bit about preparedness. There are four kinds of preparedness. I should have given a test question. How many kinds of preparedness? I was in one of the classes, and these guys, you guys are great, because it's how many are, that was exactly what you got to do. That's a military thing. You stomp on the floor, and people pay attention. And uh, normally they pass the test if they're paying attention. There's always somebody that didn't understand the foot stomping thing. So if you're in these guys' class and they stomp on the floor, write the answers down because it's going to be on the test. Four kinds of preparedness. I've added a fourth one. But the first one, and probably, no kidding, the most single important one, is individual preparedness. And that's really become my mission because that's the hardest one for me to impact. It's really tough to get people's attention because people are so busy doing all this stuff. And even with seven presidentially declared disasters, we still have people who think it won't happen to me. I, I'm, I'm at a loss. I'm at a loss for how anybody can believe that. It can happen to us sitting here right now. A truck could pull up outside that had hazardous chemicals on it, have a chlorine link, and we would all have a problem in this room right now. 
Now, I talk about this, and I, I meant to say this at the beginning. I'm not here to scare you to death. I can, but I won't. I would like your help getting other people's attentions. If you came to this workshop, you got it already. You understand it's something we need to pay attention to. My problem is it's the people that didn't come to this workshop. But all you all know somebody you can go talk to and share this with, or maybe help them get the job done. Individual preparedness. I, I saw the materials, they're great. Take those back, read them. Let me throw you a couple other things to think about on those. How many of you all have a stash of cash in your house, hidden well? I don't hold your hands up, somebody's looking. <laughs> if you have a stash of cash, please register at the desk. No. One of the problems we got real close to in the ice storm was people running out of spendable currency because the ATM machines were offline. Count on that. But hide your money. Everybody in here has probably got at least one of these things somewhere close to it. May not be a Blackberry, but you got some kind of communications device. Okay? If you both have them in your family, try to get two different carriers if you're a two-member two, two family. Because sometimes AT&T will work and Verizon won't. And sometimes Sprint will work, but AT&T won't. Something to think about. Something to think about. You need to have a stash of food and water in your house, and that's so, much, that's so common sense that you would think everybody would just do it, but it's not the case. We have people that run out of food. It's like the night before the snowstorm and you can't get into Kroger's. It's crazy, or Piggly Wiggly, or whatever. It's kind of crazy. One of the biggest cause of life during the ice storm was carbon dioxide poisoning, carbon monoxide poisoning. People that went out to Lowe's and said, I got a generator, it's gonna be good. We'll be able to watch TV. Let's we'll set it up here in the living room. <laughs> I kind of have a mission now. Whenever I go to somebody's house and they tell me they have a generator, I go and say, let's, let's look at how you set that up. Where are you going to operate that from? Over a third of the deaths were from that problem. Over a third. Over a third. We had a whole lot of people that didn't have, you know, we lost power, cell phones didn't work. We had a whole lot of people that didn't have a way to understand what was going on in their world. They did not have a battery-powered radio anywhere in the house. If you're going to buy a battery-powered radio, please go get a weather radio. I, I don't make any money off this, but the single biggest issue we face in Kentucky is weather-related. And then the last thing I'll talk about on individual preparedness is just know what's going on. Understand what the risks are in your area. If you live close to a body of water, pay attention when it rains. Do you know how many people we lose every year for trying to drive through a swollen stream? Double digit. Double digit. One of the only two deaths we had in the May floods was from somebody who thought they could drive through a swollen stream. And what was really bad was their county didn't even declare. They just, they had minor flooding. So it doesn't have to be a catastrophic flood to cause that. The next, next type of preparedness I'd like to touch about it, because you all can absolutely help me with this, is community preparedness. I was in one of the classes this morning, and you made my heart sing there for just a second, because somebody said, how many of you all know about the local emergency planning committee? And you got about two or three hands that went up. Everybody in this room ought to be a member of your local emergency planning committee. Everybody in this room ought to be a member of your local emergency planning committee. Why? So you know what the plan is. There's a mindset in Kentucky that we hired this guy called the county emergency management director and he's in charge of all that. Really? Really, you expect that one person to write the entire county plan, respond to every single call out, and make sure that everybody in the community understands what they're supposed to do. You re I've lived in a couple of counties, I haven't met anybody yet with a big red S on their shirt. But if you don't go and search yourself into that process, 
you may or may not know what the plan is. And if you find an emergency manager out there that tells you he doesn't want you on your committee, let me know, I'll buy dinner. Because these guys are trying, and gals, are trying to do Herculean work, but they need help. A fun thing to do with your senior elected officials is walk up to them and go, hey, have you read the, uh, the county emergency operations plan? Let me, and then this is the neat part, ask them this. Let me ask you about the evacuation plan and watch and see what happens. Now, the good thing about Western Kentucky is you've got some great senior elected leaders out here. I've been meeting with them nonstop for the last six weeks. And I gotta tell you, your county judge executives and many, many of your mayors are top notch. But that question is one that needs to be asked because if you don't know what the plan is, you may not have a plan and it's serious business. Because if you don't have a plan, your, your backup plan is I hope. You guys stole my thunder today. <laughs> I hope, you know what I hope is? It's not a plan. An emergency preparedness is a planning function. You've got to plan for these things. So while it's somewhat funny occasionally to laugh about it, it's really not funny when you find out that your county doesn't have a plan to deal with hazardous chemicals. Or your county plan doesn't talk about how do we evac the entire county. Because you know what's interesting about this part of the state? A couple of counties down here will have to evac the entire county. I'd kind of like to know how that's supposed to happen before we have to try to do it. At least think about it while it's blue skies and sun shining and you get some sleep, because it's really hard to do after you've been up for four days trying to figure it all out. Community planning starts with these events, and it goes through that emergency action plan, operations plan, and then it's tied into exercises and public awareness. You all are all part of that solution. So if you left here today thinking you're just going to come take some classes, you're hereby blessed. You are now part of the solution. You've got to go forward and spread the word. Part of this community preparedness that I take very, very seriously is taking care of others. One of the things that I become increasingly aware of as I get more and more of this gray hair on top of my head is how many people we've got that are in fragile health conditions. How many people in the community are on oxygen? How many people in the community are on some type of dialysis? How many people in the community are dependent on electricity or someone else? In your community, do you have a way to register those people? Do you know where they are? Do you know how to get to them? If you don't, go back and ask that question. It's critical information because when you're trying to save lives, you only have so many hours. No matter how you slice it, it ends up being in hours. Sometimes it's minutes. But you gotta know that information. So I push on that pretty hard. The third leg of a preparedness is state preparedness. And we have taken all the lessons from learned. I personally conducted 12 different after action reviews from the ice storm. I sat in on about five more. And we conduct an after action review after every single disaster that we have. And I gotta tell you, I'm very proud of my staff. We are putting those lessons in, in use. We are changing things. We're not the same. Ricky calls me now when there's gonna be bad weather. When we respond as a state, we've now organized so that we are constantly doing resource management. We now have a group of all the cabinet agencies that meet to do unified planning. We have a group that comes together to do analysis and assessment so that when the bad thing happens, we understand what, not only what you tell us is happening, but this group figures out what does it mean because we've got to figure out how to respond. Those are new, exciting concepts because we've never done those before. We've got members of our group. Brad's here from Health. Brad, glad to see you today. Great partners. Public health, we couldn't do it without public health. So we've changed the way we're doing things at the state level. We have a few new groups that we've stood up. We have now emboldened the Emergency Response Commission to look at all hazards planning to support events like this, one of the reasons I'm down here. We now have a new group that works with private sector. The key to this, and the private sector guys love hearing this, this is my, my little note that I talk to them, my job is to put them back into business. It's somewhat selfish because when they go back into business, I can get out of business. I would prefer not to have to stand up long logistics lines to try to resupply the entire state. Because if we ever have a, a long event, we're talking millions and millions and millions 
of resupply efforts, literally. And the fourth one that I've added, which never really occurred to me until about a year ago, is national preparedness. And, you know, we just celebrated, that's not the right word, we just remembered the five-year anniversary for Katrina. You don't celebrate Katrina. You look at it and you try to figure out how do we not let that ever happen in this state, and I think we're close to ensuring that. We do have a catastrophic issue to deal with, and I will close my remarks on that, but one of the things that's come about in the last 18 months that I'm extremely happy with is our relationship with the federal government. The FEMA of old is not the FEMA of new. I don't care what you see on TV. I don't care what the political pundits say. That's all crap. I will tell you from firsthand relationship that we have some of the best partners we could ever ask for in FEMA Region 4 with Administrator Phil May. We've got Mr. Laura Goza back here, one of his key deputies. And these guys, every time I've called them and said, I need, they've been in my back pocket as fast as they could to be with me to make sure that every move I made, they were with me. They're real. We sweat, they sweat. We bleed, they bleed. They don't walk away. Do we agree with them every time? Of course not. Recovery is a very tricky thing, and we're talking about precious dollars. But I will tell you, for emergency response and emergency life-saving, I couldn't ask for better partners. They're great. And the good news is that I think there's a new FEMA sheriff in charge, uh, Administrator Fugate, and I see eye to eye when we talk about emergency response. Uh, it's all about changing the outcome and saving lives, period. Changing the outcome and saving lives, period. No dancing in front of cameras, no big speech of fine. The only reason I'm here talking in front of you all today is to enlist you in part of my team. It's about changing the outcome of a bad event. And again, it can be minutes, hopefully it's within hours, because if it goes for days, we're going to see people die, bottom line. So we've got to react much, much more quickly. And we've had a great partner uh, in FEMA as we, as we plan and prepare for what most of you all in this part of the state need to take very, very seriously. And this is really the part about I don't want to scare you to death. I told you earlier I wrote one of the first response ports, once one of the first comprehensive response plans for Western Kentucky for the New Madrid Earthquake Zone Response Plan. And we exercised that in 2008 and I brought with me a large number of National Guardsmen and we went county by county by county and we figured out where your points of distribution would be. That was pretty much, and we mapped out our main supply route so we knew how to get here. And that is the plan that we used during the ice storm. We have a whole new view on this thing. I, I've actually gotten my hands on the, the Corps of Engineers and the May Center's data and we've done some significant analysis and we fully understand the potential threat in Western Kentucky now. Western Kentucky will not experience a California earthquake. And we've all got it in our mind from all those movies that we watched in the 70s, what earthquake's gonna look like. Our earthquake's probably not gonna look a lot like that. Yes, the ground will shake. And it may shake and shake and shake and shake and quit and then shake again. I'm really not too worried about the shaking. What gets you in the shaking is the stuff that falls off the shelves and smacks you in the head, and I think you all are smart enough to not be there or take that stuff down so it won't hit you in the head. What will get us is something called liquefaction. And liquefaction, I got tired of hearing the term thrown out, so I finally got my core buddies together, and I said, Steve, give me a good layman's definition of liquefaction. Steve Rager, who's our, our core coordinator, great guy. He said, well... Picture yourself on the beach, and the tide comes in and the tide goes out, and you're sitting there on the beach. We've all done that. Hopefully you've gotten a chance to do that. I want to do it again soon. You're sitting there on the beach, but when the tide comes in, you scrunch your toes. And he goes, what happens? Well, you sink down because the ground's not stable, so the weight of your body makes you sink into the ground. That's liquefaction. And if you have a significantly heavy structure, the odds are it's going to sink into the ground somewhat. In Alaska, the last time this happened, and they have the same issue we have, they had, two sto they had four story buildings sink down to a story and a half. Now, if you're in the bottom of that building on a first floor, that's not a good place to be. 
and we've got to be ready for that. The problem we've got is, depending on which study you use, we have up to 24 counties that will have some impact from this earthquake. And some of you are going, eh, earthquake's never going to happen. Next year's the 200th year remembrance of the last time it happened. It has happened. It changed the way the river goes. It created a lake. It created an island. It basically made a lot of the territory we've got in far western Kentucky look the way it does now. That and that little glacier that left about a billion years ago. It's a real deal. Only a fool will project for you an earthquake. So I'm not going to sit here and predict for you an earthquake. But I'm also not foolish enough not to start getting ready for it. We've got to have good plans that will meet the mission when it occurs. Again, I'm planning that it doesn't happen, but I'm going to prepare like it might. And that's what I want you all to do. So to do that, we spent the last eight months building a program called Active Planning. And Active Planning is a Kentucky unique approach at local community planning. You won't, you won't find it in any FEMA books. It actually occurred between me and my lead planner. And uh, I, I signed off on it about about three months ago, and we've spent the last six weeks in Western Kentucky meeting with two counties at a time, running two different sessions. One that I run, or one of my senior leaders runs, where we meet with the senior elected officials, and we ask the really hard questions. And, you know, you think these are going to be really tough, like Einstein, they're not. It's real simple. Who's going to do what, when, where, and how, with what resources, if it happens right now? And I wish I could tell you that we've got those answers, but it's a good thing we're doing active planning. And then we have another a whole day session where we meet with your emergency response community and we ask those same questions and we're documenting that in a database so that we can take the best business practices from everybody and share those. And that's been going on now for six weeks and it's been quite an effort, um, but it's been unbelievably rewarding to have those dialogues and those discussions. We, we have changed our response plan based off some of the lessons that we've learned. But active planning is the tool that we're using to make sure of the solution that we're going to put into place to bridge the gap. And I talk about the gap. Let me tell you the gap I'm worried about. I'm worried about the trust gap. Everybody do this. Now, I just watched you yawn, so if you do this and you fall asleep, I'm going to come back and wake you up, okay? Because it's the worst thing to be the guy after lunch. But I need everybody to do this for me for a second. Everybody close your eyes. I'll tell you when to wake up. You just woke up and the lights aren't on. So you get up out of your bed and you go to the light switch and the lights don't come on. And you feel the ground shake again because you thought that's what woke you up. And then you notice that it's a little bit cold in the house. So you go to the door and you realize that you can't get the door open. You can open your eyes now. You pick up your cell phone, try to make a phone call. There's no signal. Go to your landline, try to make a phone call. There's no signal. Hmm, well, I'll make some coffee. That's what I do. <laughs> you go to the faucet and turn the faucet, and the water starts to come out, but it doesn't keep coming. Get about half a pot. Hope that lasts. So now you're wondering, let's go check the TV. Guess what? Nothing on TV. You go to your radio, but then you remember that you didn't pick up that D-sized battery from Walmart, so it's not going to work. What are you going to do? What if you're a magistrate or you're the county judge executive or you're a civic leader? What do you do? What do you do when you finally get out that door and you realize that there's about a foot and a half of water in your yard and your, your yard has never flooded before? What's going on? Go out, finally get the car started, try to back out of the driveway, and then realize that 150-year-old oak tree that you always thought was so pretty is now laying right across your driveway. 
But you figure out, put the, put the Explorer in four-wheel drive, drive around the end of the tree, get on the road, and then you realize about every quarter mile there's a tree in the road. Where are you going? What are you trying to do? That's a real-world potential scenario for New Madrid, if it happened. Will it happen exactly like that? No. Could it? Yes. Emergency preparedness. Active planning is all about making sure that your community knows exactly who's going to take care of your people. As I said, we have three counties in Kentucky that if it goes as bad as it could, we will be taking every single person out of those counties. Where are we going to take them? Gee, I wonder. Can you evacuate everybody out of western Kentucky? No. Would all Kentuckians evacuate anyway? No. What are we going to do about the livestock? Fences are going to be down. Massive flooding, at least potentially, at least for the first few hours. We think the water is going to come up then go back down. Some places. Some places the water may just start emptying. You have a few dams down here, I'm told. You have a lot of rivers. I was sitting in one of these classes and somebody asked the question, y'all got any rivers here? Oh yeah, we have a few. We have a few and flat ground. Active planning is the role of doing that. How will you know what your county's plan is? What do you need to go do? Somebody tell me. How do you find out about your county's plan? Local emergency planning committee. I need you to be part of that. I need you to be part of that. Because the goal here is to train you to not be a victim, but to be a survivor and then to be part of the solution. It's a choice you have to make today and every day. Are you going to be one of the people I've got to come save or are you going to be one of the people that helps me save people? If you're in this room, I think you want to help us save people. But you've got to be prepared, and you've got to make sure that your neighbor's prepared, because you may need to go help take care of them. And if you're doing that, that's great, because that's one more family that we don't have to rescue. Let me end on this last note. Um, two notes. We have a weather conference coming up the 19th and 20th of November. If you'll go to our website and take a look at that, I'd love to have you be part of that. I think it's going to be a great event. But the last thing I want to talk about before I get off the stage, and I've probably gone just a little bit longer than they wanted me to, I want to talk about our volunteer agencies and our volunteer organizations. Uh, I, it gets me a little bit when I do this, so I've got to be careful. Flat out, no kidding. We cannot do our job without our volunteer agencies. They are the only thing that makes it work. I can get life-saving in there immediately. I can pull people off roofs. I can throw money at restoring a community. But do you know who restores lives? It's the Red Cross. It's all the religious organizations that reach into their own pocket and show up and make things happen. So if you get a chance today or any dime to contribute to one of those organizations or just reach out and say thank you, thank you, you guys make a tremendous difference. So I can tell you from firsthand experience through seven of these, the Red Cross has been at every one of them. I'm not going to name the various religious groups because I always leave somebody out. I can hardly remember them all. They're all amazing. They're all funded privately, meaning you and I donating to their cause. They don't get a bunch of government handouts, and they truly, truly make the difference. Let's give them a round of applause, please. Thank you all for that, and I appreciate your attention today. Um, if anything I've said resonates with you and you want to be part of the solution, please be part of it in your local community. We need all the volunteers we can get. Uh, I, if, if any one of you all goes back and joins your local emergency planning committee or takes a chance to talk to your senior elected official about your local plan, this has been a successful day for me. Thank you all very much, and I appreciate you. Thank you.